recording has started. Alrighty, thank you everybody for coming uh, to our and, yeah. I'm sorry, for the presenters, when you are the presenter and you want to move the presenter rights, you need to right click on the name and then presenter rights. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming to today's webinar on OER and intellectual property. Um, we have Rachel Bridgewater, um, librarian at Portland Community College and Cable Green, director of open education at Creative Commons. And um, this webinar is hosted by the Orbis Cascade Alliance. So I'll turn it over to you, Rachel. Excellent. Well, hello. Um, I am um, really excited to talk to you about OER and copyright. Um, I am going to really focus on um, parts of um, the puzzle that don't involve the Creative Commons licenses um, during my presentation, uh, uh, assuming that Cable will kind of cover the Creative Commons side of the house pretty well, but um, we'll definitely have lots of time for, um, for questions um, as well. I'm just getting my little timer here so I don't want to run over. Okay, so um, I, uh, as Amy said, am the as a, am a librarian at uh, Portland Community College, and um, in my role there, I'm the chair of the copyright committee. So I kind of answer all the copyright questions for the college, and I um, I'm also the co-chair of our OER committee. And um, I guess I'll start by relaying like one of the first times I ever spoke with a faculty member at. Um, at PCC about um, using OER, she said this to me. She said, oh, I already moved my class to OER, and I just started having them use public domain materials. And I was suspicious, so I had her show me what. And um, it was, of course, not public domain materials, but rather publicly available materials. And I realized, and so this is not to make fun of that instructor at all, but um, just to sort of say that I realized in my own work that um, talking about that the copyright issues that were going to come up when I helped people with OER would also, um, I kind of thought I would just spend a lot of time like helping them figure out which Creative Commons license to choose, right? But what I found is that it surfaces a lot of just misunderstandings that faculty have about copyright basics. Um, and this is like whether they are um, adopting materials um, or creating new materials and there's some slightly different issues that come up um, in each of those scenarios and I think um, there's like a whole bunch of stuff right there's like still a lot of confusion between like linking and copying and what copyright even covers and that that question that I just covered with you know, is it public domain or is it just freely available and lots of confusion about fair use and then, you know, it of course also surfaces just a lot of people who, who have never really cared about whether they're pirating or <laughs> um, where they stand with regard to copyright before. So there's this sort of whole mishmash of issues that come up. Um, and uh, so I'll sort of start in here by saying I'm not a lawyer and um, nothing that I will say constitutes legal advice. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do want to kind well, of walk. I just put it in the, the, the uh, start here. You know. What's that? Yeah. I hear someone speaking. Is there a question? Yeah. I think maybe somebody's just not muted. Okay, so but what I do want to do is kind of walk through how, in my experience, lawyers think about um, copyright issues, right? Um, and that is to think really systematically about the use that you want to make and to ask yourself a series of questions systematically. So, and these questions are in my formulation, I've seen this sort of broken out as five questions, but um, you know, does my use exercise one of the, the rights of copyright? Is the work copyrighted or copyrightable? Is the use permitted by some something, <laughs> right? A limitation, exception, or license? Yeah, and, um, and if not, then I need to go ahead and get permission or use something else or use what 
I um, intended to use in a different way that, that might change the details, right? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. This is just to say uh, I've, I think we've, anyone who's ever done any kind of copyright consultation um, find that there is a class of very cautious people who are afraid to like even put a link to something that's freely available. Um, linking isn't doing anything with copyright, right? It's not actually exercising one of the copyright owner's exclusive rights, so go for it, right? <laughs> um, but this next one can be trickier, right? This question of like, is the work copyrighted or copyrightable? Um, and so to kind of review, uh, and it's probably review for most of you, things that aren't copyrighted or copyrightable would be things in the public domain, um, things produced by the federal government, facts and ideas. Um, and I think, you know, the public domain is tricky, right, because um, there's that whole, you know, anything before 1923 we, we know is in the public domain, and then there's a whole kind of class of stuff from 1923 through the sort of middle of the century um, where it depends, right? So there's lots of great resources online that can help you figure out if something's in the public domain, if it is not an or orphan work, right? If you can even figure out like who the copyright owner is. But one thing I wanted to mention about the public domain is that um, it's not at all uncommon for um, cultural institutions that own um, works that are in the public domain to um, assert some sort of ownership rights over them um, and usually the way that they do that is through licensing, right? You can get a high resolution copy of this, you know, Monet painting if you buy it from us and agree to the terms of our license, but the, the institution that owns it doesn't own the the, the material itself, and if you have a legally acquired copy of that work that isn't subject to those license terms, you can use it regardless of what that institution might be asserting about its use. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. But, um, and then it's also important, and when we come to talking about fair use, it's important to remember that, like, the closer something is to being facts, kind of like the less copyright it has, right? So most charts and graphs are going to have some copyright. Um, if you're working with faculty who want to include third-party charts and graphs um, in OER material that they're creating um, or um, if they're converting their class to OER and they want to include some of these materials. I think the, the safest and best thing to do is to use the underlying facts, the data, which is not copyrightable, to just make their own new chart. Um, but even failing that when we look at fair use, those things with that kind of thin copyright um, are easier to use in a way that's fair. And then just a moment here to talk about things that are not copyright, right? Um, and this, especially the, the first and the last of these on the screen, trademarks and sort of privacy and personality rights, um, tend to surface in, in conversations about copyright. But remember that trademark is a different part of intellectual property law. And generally speaking, if we're using trademarks in educational materials, um, and we're not um, saying libelous things, right? We're not disparaging the brand. Um, and there's no possibility that the user is going to confuse um, the educational material that we've made with whatever logo or whatever it is that we're including. Um, trademark are probably fine to use, right? Um, Again, a little bit outside of my area of expertise, but that's my understanding as far as like trademark and OER go. And then the, I'll just mention the personality rights and privacy rights piece because I get a ton of questions, usually not in the 
realm of OER around here's a picture of a person and I don't have a release from them. What are the copyright implications? And that's actually the, the photograph would have copyright, but the, the right to depict the person or their privacy rights or their personality rights is not copyright. It and it would be governed by by individual state laws, right? Um, again, probably not super likely to come up in OER. Um, but I'm going to cruise right along here to the big one, right? Um, and this is, is the use permitted by a limitation, exemption, or license, right? So um, on the happy side, right, is there a Creative Commons license in place um, or some other license that says, yeah, go ahead and use this work in this way? Um, you don't have to do further work or analysis, right? You're, you're, you're good. The license says you can do it. Um, on the flip side, is there some sort of license in place that you or the institution have agreed to that says that you won't use the material in a certain way, you know, regardless of whether it would otherwise be a fair use, in which case you need to um, follow the terms of that license. I'm not going to talk any more about Creative Commons licenses at this point. Um, I'll leave that to Cable. Um, so, assuming that licenses aren't in place, we're left with the exceptions and limitations on the, um, on the Copyright Act. And um, these are the ones that tend to apply in our settings, right? Um, and for OER, um, Mama? it is really um, fair use that we'll, we'll mainly be talking about, right? But maybe also 110.1 or 110.2. Does anybody have any questions about classroom copying or the Teach Act that they want me to address before I move on to talk about fair use? Rachel, nothing's happening in okay. the chat right now. <laughs> Although if people want to chat, I'll be sure to pass them along. Okay, good. I'm I'm blind, so I, <laughs> I'm blind to the chat. So I don't I don't know. All right. So wait, we you. have one. Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, Cable says, "What does the Teach Act provide with re with respect to rights that fair use does not?" <laughs> In my opinion, very little, right? I think that the TEACH Act um, is, uh, is kind of a bummer, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, uh, I think most of what we can do with the TEACH Act, I, I think anything we were likely to do with the TEACH Act would also be a fair use, plus fair use gives us more, in my opinion. Um, I think one thing that the TEACH Act can do um, for very risk-averse institutions is for the narrow set of circumstances where it unambiguously applies, they can know confidently that they are, um, that they are compliant, right? And fair use will, will never really offer that level of confidence because it's not designed to do so. Hope that answers it. Not a big fan of teach. <laughs> so fair use. Um, I'd like you all just to take a second to think about your own answer to what is fair use, right? <laughs> um, and if if I wanted to spend a ton of time on it, I might have us do a little exercise, but I think we can just like in our own minds come up with an answer to that. And um, to my mind, fair use is a First Amendment, right? Right? It's, um, it's rooted in the First Amendment. The idea is um, we have the right to use copyrighted material without any permission under certain circumstances when there's like a benefit to society um, that's going to be a, a greater benefit to society than the damage to the copyright holder, right? And, um, and so there isn't um, a set of bright line tests that we can use. 
um, because it's a by its nature going to be case by case. Um, and we all know that nice four factor um, uh, test that uh, that we get in the 1976 Copyright Act that access, asks us to look at the purpose of our use, the, the nature of what we want to use, how much we want to use it, and the effect on the market. Um, I think especially more and more as we get more fair use cases, um, a helpful way of looking at fair use is um, by asking questions about transformativeness, right? Um, is the, the use that you're making um, add value to or repurpose the material for a new audience, right? And is the amount that you're using appropriate um, to that transformative reuse? Oh, use doesn't have to be transformative in order to be fair, but this sort of two-pronged question is often sort of easier, I think, for people to answer than this four-factor test and kind of condenses those four factors into two questions, right? Um, and I'll let that sit there for a second in case people have questions about that. Um, so in our context, right, talking about OER, um, we can think about taking material that was that's copyrighted and designed for an educational market like a commercial textbook, right? Um, it's obvious that to me when we ask questions about transformativeness that if we want to like convert our class to OER and, and make use of some copyrighted materials under fair use as part of that, um, we're not going to be able to really draw on those commercial textbooks, right? That's not going to be a transformative use. But some of that material like my instructor wanted to use, a poem, we may very well be able to use, right? Um, and we also have a really great um, body of work in these codes of best practices for the Center for Media and Social Impact that we can turn to, I think especially the code of best practices for fair use in open courseware and for fair use in research and academic libraries that can help us think about how to how to think about fair use with OER. Um, there's a very strange noise coming over. <laughs> um, I would say some things to keep in mind about fair use and OER. We want to remember that educational uses are not automatically fair. That fair use is medium and format neutral. I often get people asking me like, well, I have a I have a DVD and that can never be fair use or I, I, I want to put something online and so it obviously can't be fair use. The fair use is not, doesn't talk about um, medium and format. Um, now it might come into play if we're thinking about market impact, right, if you're going to put something on the web and have it be freely available to everyone, that's obviously going to have a market impact so you want to think about it in, on, that, on that fourth factor. But, um, there's no amount that is always or never fair. Uses don't have to pass all four factors in order to be a, a fair use. Um, and then I, I just want to put in my own personal uh, sort of um, pet peeve, you know, sort of, I think people will often say, well, fair use is a defense, right? Um, I think that we should probably think about fair use more as a, as a right. It's, it's part of the part of the copyright law and, and we're allowed to use it to make these societally beneficial uses that we want to want to make, right? Um, so when we're, when we're creating OER, right, fair use does introduce complexity though. Um, so a question I get all the time is, you know, uh, my, I'm working with faculty who's creating OER and they want to include some third party material in there um, and it's, it's pretty clear that in their context, in the material that they're making, that use is fair, but will it make a problem down the line? And the question, the answer is, of course, it's hard to say because downstream users might do all kinds of different things depending on what Creative Commons license you put on it, right? They might 
do all kinds of different things and their use of that material might not be fair, right? So asking some questions about like how much that complexity is worth it, I think is, is important. And then especially, especially, especially providing attribution and just being really clear that, you know, for this bit of material, I am relying on fair use um, so that that triggers the downstream user to be aware that they also need to assess whether their use is fair. Um, so, you know, so then finally we get to if no license or exception allows us to do it, we're going to need to get permission or we're going to need to use something else or we're going to need to change how we're using the thing we want to use, right? Use less of it, use it um, with more critique and commentary, whatever. Um, Rachel, we have a hand up from Cable. Yes. Cable, do you want to turn your mic on and just talk? Yeah, uh, Rachel, this is fabulous. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, you correctly pointed out that a lot of OER is a mix of different licensed works, uh, sometimes people using copyrighted works under fair use, or maybe even other licensed terms. And right, right. Uh, I think it's important for the participants to know that uh, if you're using somebody else's copyrighted work under fair use, you don't have the rights necessary to put a Creative Commons license on that. So oftentimes what OER users do is they'll flag something and say, I'm using this under fair use, you know, buyer beware. <laughs> you, you may or may not be able to use it under fair use, but they kind of flag it. Um, and, and then also, it's also a common practice to, if people are worried about, as you said, downstream effects where maybe a use isn't covered under fair use, oftentimes they'll pull that fair use work out of their OER collection before they share it forward, which is a safe thing to do, but it's it's also unfortunate in the sense that it creates Swiss cheese, if you will. Yeah, yeah, and, and in a sense, like, if, if, the, if the third party work, I would say, is, like, critical enough to what you're doing to make it fair use, pulling it out <laughs> should make what you have left not make a lot of sense anymore, right? Because the idea is like when you're using something under fair use, you're using it because that's what you need in order to make your criticism, your comment, your educational use, right? So I think that that's a good little test that users could um, put to a good sort of um, mental exercise for them, like, if I plan on just taking this out and I think that my thing will be just as useful without it, perhaps my use isn't actually as fair as I think it is, right? Um, something I think about. Um, and yeah, Rachel, great. before we, um, sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> it's hard to know when to jump in. Um, while we're talking about using um, different kinds of things with various kinds of mm -hmm. permissions. There was a public domain question from Ben earlier that okay. might be uh, worth asking now. So yeah. he says, my understanding about US federal, state, and local publications was that they're public domain with a few pos possible exceptions and could therefore be included in OER materials without permissions sound right. Federal government materials are public domain. Most state government materials are not. Um, and it's sort of a mishmash. Um, and uh, um, there's a great project that, that um, maps um, state laws that, um, that Kyle Courtney is doing. Um, and I can put a link into the chat box when I'm, um, when I'm done presenting. Um, but for state and, and local materials, it gets much more complex. But yes, for federal government materials, um, those are in the public domain. There's some complexity in there because occasionally there's, you know, um, something that's hosted on the NASA site, but they contracted with someone to take some photographs and they retain the copyright. So, I mean, you need to look for anything where it says, this is copyright whomever, but where the federal government is the copyright, would have been the copyright owner, um, that we the people are the copyright owner. 
and yes, so many of those federal government materials, I think, are, are wonderful options to include in OER. And Cable is adding, one of the challenges is that um, U.S. federal resources are in the U.S. public domain, not necessarily the global public domain, which can be a problem when another country wants to use OER that contains U.S. public domain resources. And Ben is saying thanks, so I think you answered okay. his question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time. I, I was, I, I'll briefly mention, you know, this, <laughs> um, and I didn't even, I was kind of on the fence about whether to go into it, but I think it's a big question that people have a lot of times is around um, who owns the copyright, right? So like at PCC, full-time faculty, according to our contract, intellectual property that we make is owned by the college, and so when we when we make an OER, we, we wouldn't, according to the co contract as it stands now, have the right to put a, a Creative Commons license on it, right? Um, so we have a little sort of um, inelegant, elegant, I don't know, you tell me, um, <laughs> solution to that, and that is um, working with administration, we put up this little form that basically says, you know, if you work for the college and you made something that you want to put a Creative Commons license on, fill out this form, and by filling it out, you basically get permission from the college to apply that Creative Commons license. And uh, so far, so good. <laughs> um, so that's how we, um, how we dealt with that. Um, I think, obviously, a better solution would be um, getting clarity in the contract, but um, that that's a, a more difficult and lengthier process, but um, this works for now. But um, I think something that, that Cable would say as well is like one of the challenges is like you need to be the copyright owner in order to put a Creative Commons license on something. Um, so you should, you're, if you're working with faculty who are doing OER, you should be sure that they know what their ownership rights are um, before they um, do anything like that. And um, I'll just leave that for now. And I, you'll see at the bottom of my screen here, you know, I included some things in this presentation that, um, that I don't own the copyright on and that I might have been using fair use um, or that um, is somebody else's Creative Commons license thing. And so I'm saying, you know, except we're noted, um, this is licensed under a, under a CC BY license. So um, an example of navigating that stuff. Um, so any questions? Thanks, Rachel. I don't see questions in the chat okay. right now, so I think let's have you hand I presenter hand mode over to Kate. Let's see if I. Here we go. Mama, will you read me this? <laughs> Hang on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think Cable should be the presenter now. I have a little presentation buddy here beside me, so I. <laughs> Well, put him on video. We, we want to see him. <laughs> you want to be on okay. video for a second, buddy? Uh, <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, so I'm full screen. Can Whoops, hang on a second. Okay, now I'm full screen. Can somebody tell me if it's working? It's working great. Thank you. Looks good. Okay. Uh, Rachel, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, I, I learned a lot. Uh, let me also say I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. I like that intro a lot. Um, so a couple things. One is my email and my Twitter are at the bottom here. If any of you want to talk more about any of these topics or other things relating to CC, I'm always happy to do so. Um, I'm a little slow on email. If you want to uh, know what I'm working on or get my attention, uh, the Twitter feed is usually a, a better way to go. So I'm just at Seagreen. Uh, like uh, like Rachel, unless otherwise noted, uh, all of these works are under a, a CC BY license, although I must commend Rachel. Her attribution is stellar. 
uh, and I need to, t <laughs> I'm going to go back through my slides and do a better job because she really sets the bar high for what proper attribution looks like in a slide deck. Um, just to, I'm going to only show a few slides and then I thought I'd stop and, and we could have a conversation. Um, I think those of you who've seen me talk have probably seen these before. Um, you know, first I always like to say, you know, why are we even having this conversation about open educational resources? And um, yes, it's because of open licensing, but mainly it's because we've got the internet and educational resources have gone digital and we have new communication tools that we've never had before and the costs have looked like this now. And so we're, we're really at a point where we get to have conversations about when we can share at the marginal cost of zero once something is produced, should we? Um, I just got off the phone with, uh, with Spark and um, I think many of you if, who are librarians certainly know who Spark is. Uh, and we were having a conversation today about the vice president's call for to open up uh, cancer research and to cure cancer, the Moonshot Initiative that, that the vice president of the United States is working on. And we're literally having a conversation of, hey, the public funded cancer research, um, not only should that research be freely available to the public, uh, but the public uh, should have legal rights to do what's called text and data mining so that you could analyze it in mass with other cancer articles. The research data that goes with those articles should also be uh, openly licensed or more to the point dedicated to the public domain. And these are, and why do we get to have those conversations? Because we can share at the marginal cost of zero. Um, and it's also the, the moral and ethical thing to do. Uh, if we want to cure cancer, if we want to stop Zika, um, we have it in our power to share information at the speed of light for near zero cost today. Um, so all of these great things that Rachel was talking about um, uh, and that I'll talk about, you know, the internet enables, but uh, I think Rachel did a fabulous job talking about the complexities of copyright law and of fair use uh, and that it can be very tricky to navigate uh, copyright. Um, before I jump into CC licensing, I always like to be very clear about what we mean about open educational resources. So the educational resources component of this obviously is everything that we use in, in teaching and learning. The open part of it, uh, we mean something very specific in the OER movement. Um, first is that we have free and unfettered access. So free, we mean no cost. Unfettered access means, you know, it's not hard. You don't have to put in a credit card number. You don't have to create an account. You don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops. It's, it's relatively easy to get access, download, make a copy, etc. And then second, that you've got the, the copyright permissions, the legal permissions to engage what David Wiley calls the 5R activities. And so uh, oftentimes, and I know you've seen this at your campuses, uh, faculty and, and others conflate open with free. And this is a conversation we're having with the cancer researchers right now. Um, you know, the, the publishers, especially the big journal publishers, Elsevier and others, are really pushing this idea that free access should be enough, but the cancer researchers are pushing back and saying, no, we actually need open licenses on the articles so that we can text and data mine, you know, 100,000 cancer articles simultaneously and get derivative reports so that we can analyze what particular genes do in the body and we can look at 10 years of research and our computers can actually analyze and create derivative works of, of those resources. Now that may or may not be fair use, but the cancer researchers are saying, you shouldn't have to make us jump through any of those hoops, just open up the cancer research. And so, you know, free is assumed online. And so open is different than free. And we argue as a movement that open is better than free because open is free plus the legal permissions to do these five things. And so uh, where uh, Rachel did a great job walking through fair use and the legal rights that you have in the United States under copyright law to use something even if you don't have a license. And you should, we all should absolutely maximize uh, our fair use rights everywhere we can. Um, in addition to that, it's helpful when something has an open license on it so that we have very clear, unequivocal rights to do these things. And so in open educational resources, uh, we say that for something to be OER, you actually have to have the legal rights to do these five things. 
Um, so retain, and, the, and again, this, the credit here goes to David Wiley, um, who continues to think about and update this. Um, retain is the idea that you get, you get to keep a copy, and as obvious as that sounds, um, the new textbook publisher models um, are to not allow you to retain or your students to retain. Uh, they're, they're leasing, they're not selling ebooks uh, to students. Uh, the li librarians in Orbis Cascade will know that it's been common practice for a long time to essentially license access to databases of journals. And the moment you stop paying your, your license access fee, you lose access. So this idea of, uh, of, of owning, a, not owning, but uh, being able to legally retain a copy uh, forever is, is really important, especially in an age where business models are in many cases adjusting to create artificial scarcity in a world of information abundance. And then the, the rest of these are fairly self-explanatory as, as well. A reuse, we can use it as it is. Revise, we can modify it. Remix, we can take two or more things and mash them together, which is very common in OER. And then redistribute, we, can, we have the legal right to share it with others. And so David likes to say that you know, retain is fundamental because if you don't have a copy, you can't revise or remix. And so as we're thinking about what we do, the procurement practices we adopt, the contracts that we write, one thing we really need to watch out for are these new artificial scarcity models that are trying to take the, the right of retention away from, from faculty and libraries and from students. Uh, we've also seen as OER is going mainstream, we're seeing more and more open washing. Um, it, not just using the word open where something's not open, which is kind of the first wave that we saw, um, but we're also seeing uh, free but gated access, they're calling that open, or in some cases it, uh, actually adding terms of service that are even stronger than all rights reserved copyright. Um, and once you uh, enter in and sign up for those terms of service. That's a, a license that you've you've signed into to access a particular platform or content, and that can bind you so that maybe you don't even uh, have you know rights that you had before signing the TOS. And so, uh, so these are all things to watch out for. This, by the way, is not new. We saw the exact same thing happen with the green movement, the environmental movement, and, and other social movements uh, as they move forward. Uh, opponents uh, seek to take the narrative and their terms away from them. So it's something we just have to uh, keep up, keep an eye out for. Um, you know, when we think about OER, um, oftentimes the two big things that come up are, are cost and permissions, the legal permissions we have. Um, and these are just three examples. There are many more examples of what we use in, in education, uh, but we know the textbooks are expensive. We don't have to talk about that today. Uh, but that the rights are also restrictive. And so I, I just had a sit down meeting with my, I have two young uh, kids, my wife and I do. Uh, we were talking with the principal and uh, my wife always says, you know, don't talk about open, don't talk about OER, but I can't help myself. And we started talking about um, how out of date the, the, the commercial textbooks are that, that my kids or our kids school uses. And they're about 10 years out of date. And the, the principal, without any prompting from me, said, yeah, and the real problem is we, we don't have the legal rights to update the content. And so it's a, it's a challenge. Um, you know as librarians that uh, what, what you're able to provide out of your libraries, which is an amazing resource, are free resources. In many cases, they're open, but you also offer a lot of uh, resources that are licensed to your school or through the Orbis Cascade Alliance uh, or maybe through your state, which are also all fabulous. Um, but you may not have retention rights. You may not have revision rights. Um, not to say we shouldn't do those things. We will always have a mixed market of what we provide in terms of learning resources, and that's okay. But it's just something to think about as we move forward with OER, when you have an opportunity to think about procurement or a policy or uh, maybe a grant that you're letting to think about uh, how you can maximize reuse downstream. So that's all I'll lead up to. I'll talk very briefly about CC licenses and then, and then stop and we can, we can chat. Uh, so this is where I work. Uh, we're at Creative Commons. I'm the uh, director of education there. Uh, we're a global nonprofit. Um, yes, we work in the United States, but we also work uh, in every country in the world. Um, we've got teams in 85 countries. Uh, we're now, uh, what, 15 years old and, and counting. 
uh, and we create the, and steward the standard global open copyright licenses that the world uses to share, uh, to share copyrighted resources. And so the first thing people usually ask is, well, why? why? Why do we need Creative Commons? Why does this even exist? And as Rachel did such a nice job talking about, the public domain is ideal, right? We, the, but the challenge is, as she started with, is that you, know, you have to go back before 1923 uh, to find works that are in the US public domain. Um, there's complications with US government resources that are only in the US public domain. Some other countries have access, some do not. We've got orphan works problems. So there's all these complicating factors. And the current in the United States for something to go into the public domain, first the author has to die, then you have to wait 70 years. Corporations can get additional time on top of that. Mickey Mouse is about to go into the public domain again in the next few years. You can be sure that Disney will be heavily lobbying Congress to extend the term of copyright again. And so, you know, this goes on and on, and it's, it's increasingly difficult for works to make their way into the public domain, and it's taking longer and longer. And so Creative Commons came along and said, look, that's all, you know, maybe that's not okay, and certainly we are involved with global copyright reform, and we think that the term of copyright is, is too long, and we fight that fight along with several other orgs around the world. But at the same time, we don't, that, that's a long play fight, and a long, it's very hard to reform copyright. In fact, you know, it's going the other direction right now with things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other international agreements. And so in the meantime, uh, Creative Commons is essentially a, you know, it's a hack uh, on copyright, or uh, as David likes to say, a judo move on copyright, uh, where the, any copyright holder on, in the world can, can add a Creative Commons license to their work if they choose to share, and their, the, the license, the CC license itself is backed by the full force of the copyright. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with this. There are multiple conditions that you can choose. All of the licenses require attribution. The other three are optional. Um, share alike essentially means if somebody modifies your work, creates a derivative work, that, that modified work must be licensed under the same terms as the original. Non-commercial is what it sounds like. You can't sell the work. Um, in the OER space, non-commercial continues to uh, cause challenges. Um, in fact, right now in the K-12 space, um, there are uh, uh, resources out there, the Engage New York resources that have a buy NCSA license on them. And as school districts are seeking to, and by the way, the adoption of these resources are, of, of these OER are tremendously high. Something like, I forget the RAND report stat on it. I think it was over 65% of the K-12 schools in the United States, um, which is huge, uh, are using Engage New York materials. And when they want to print those materials, they're going to big commercial printers like Kinko's or uh, FedEx or uh, you know other, other uh, Office Depot, and they're going in to use uh, the printers and they're handing off the USB drive, walking away, coming back and getting the 2,000 copies of printed OER. Um, and there's, a, there's friction right now. Um, the, the copyright holders are uh, suggesting uh, in court, actually, uh, that that violates the non-commercial clause. And so in, in uh, OER, we try to be really careful about which license we chose because as Rachel said, there are downstream effects. Um, no derivatives is what it sounds like you can't modify the work. You can make a copy of it. Um, you can translate it for personal use, but you can't, um, you can't uh, change it and then share it forward. So th this renders one of six different Creative Commons licenses when you mix and match those uh, conditions together. And then to a prior point, when we're thinking about open educational resources and the five R permissions, only some of the Creative Commons licenses work for OER. The two no derivatives licenses um, are not OER because you can't revise or remix them. So it violates the very definitions uh, of OER that are used, the Hewlett definition, UNESCO, OECDs, et cetera. Um, so the, the other four licenses are fine. And then of course, CC0, uh, which is our public domain dedication uh, to give up your copyright and dedicate your work to the public domain right away. Obviously, that's that's OER as well, and so you know when 
when you're helping faculty to think about what license they might choose, uh, or if you're offering a, a grant and you're thinking about a license requirement, et cetera, um, the kind of general rule of thumb is the closer to the top of this list that you can be, the more freedoms and permissions you're extending to downstream users and the less friction there will be in reuse, remix, et cetera, uh, of, of the works that, that you're licensing. Okay, well, we so, have a uh, question in the chat. Um, Jane says, once you assign a CC license to something you create, can you change the license? Ah, oh, that's a great question. So uh, it has a two-part answer. The first answer is yes, the copyright holder can always change the license, and, and many do. Uh, the, the common thing that we see in the OER space is that somebody who's new to OER might choose a more restrictive license or a license with more conditions on it, and then over time move to a less restrictive license. So they might start with a, a buy NC license and maybe move to CC BY. Or they might start with buy and CSA. So MIT right now is on buy and CSA, and they're having a conversation about whether or not they want to drop the NC and just move to buy SA. So that's quite common, and the copyright holder can, can relicense as they see fit. The second part of that answer is that Creative Commons licenses are irrevocable, meaning that when, when a copyright holder puts a CC license on a work, that, that work is licensed under that CC license forever as long as it's under copyright, and then eventually it goes into the public domain, at which point the license becomes null and void because it's not under copyright anymore. Um, so to play that out, if I license a work under, say, by SA, and then I decide I want to license it CC BY, I can do that, but now my work is under two licenses, which is fine. You can do a license works. Um, the practical part of that is that the world and users of your work are going to see the most current version that you've got out there and on your website or in your repository, et cetera. But just know that when you license something under a CC license, the terms, the license is irrevocable. Now we do that for a very specific reason. Um, a good example you might be aware of is Flat World Knowledge Books. Uh, Flat World used to be CC licensed. Their new books are, are no longer CC licensed. Um, they simply changed their business model. But we can all still use the older Flat World books under the terms of the CC license. And the idea there is that if you've taken the time to weave OER into your course, um, it's harmful if the copyright holder can reach in and pull it out. And so the CC license is ensured that that can't happen. Amy, were there other questions? Not right now. You're good. OK. So um, just a few quick stats. Um, this is what the growth of Creative Commons licenses look like. And if you look at that last little twitch between 2014 and 2015, uh, it's, it's clearly a J curve. And in fact, this slope is accelerating. And I think that when we show the 2015 to 2016 data, you're going to see that slope getting even steeper. Um, so this is exciting. Um, it's also not that many, right? A billion works is a lot, but it's also not very many. Uh, if you think about how many images are uploaded to the web every day from people's phones, for example, it's in the billions per day. And so uh, we are working on this end of it. We're working, um, in fact, we have a new team working with platforms uh, around the world, big platforms that people use to make it easy for them to CC license their works. But even, uh, and this is how many uh, views there were of CC license deeds last year. So there's lots of use, there's lots of licensed works. Um, and you'll see this in the State of the Commons report. If you just go to State of the Commons, you'll see an annual report that we put up about these kinds of statistics, and we'll do one uh, in, for 2016 as well. Um, but even more important, if you look at our new strategic plan, it's really not about, and our focus is not about how many works are out there in the Commons, but rather um, What's the, what's the value of those works? Who's using them? Is there collaboration? Is discovery easier? Um, how do we make discovery easier? How do we enable uh, collaboration and remix? Um, how do we assist others in their 
advocacy and uh, and reform efforts. And so we're really shifting toward you know how much stuff is in the commons to how can we as Creative Commons help to infuse joy and excitement and gratitude uh, when somebody else shares their work. And so we are investing in uh, new technologies, in new uh, platform work to really uh, invigorate the commons and make it an exciting place to go. At the, while we do that, certainly there will be more stuff that's added to the commons, but it's a real strategic shift for us and we're uh, realigning the organization and our staff to meet those new goals. Uh, Amy, I think I'll stop there and uh, maybe we can open it up for a discussion. Thanks, Cable. Um, are you able to see the chat now? Yes, I am. Okay, and I would suggest uh, maybe we can get Rachel um, to turn her mic back on as well. And my suggestion would be, since we have a couple of folks joining us on the phone, to read out the question before you answer it. So Cable, this looks like a question for you. Um, Karen says, can you talk more about the new technologies you just mentioned that will inspire joy and collaboration? I love that question. Yeah, I wish I had some to show you. Um, we're just now hiring the technical team and we're hiring a new uh, te chief technical officer to lead these efforts, but I can give you uh, some hints about what we're thinking about. Um, and these are no secrets, it's just that they're not built yet. Um, so one of the things we have, and if you go to, I think it's creativecommons.org slash platforms or platform, uh, maybe somebody could find it and drop that link in, um, you'll see that we're um, doubling down on our efforts to work with existing platforms like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, um, Flickr, I mean, you name it, uh, any, any platform where there's a lot of use. And certainly my input on that is on education platforms. So we're trying to make it easier for people to share when they want to share. So that's one thing. Um, on the Creative Commons tools, we're going to completely tear down uh, our both our website and our CC license chooser and rebuild both. So the CC website will be uh, cleaner and more user friendly. That'll be helpful. But the chooser being a tool, um, uh, I think you're going to see options in the future chooser, and we will infuse this into platforms as well, uh, where you will be able to get data or analytics on the use and reuse of your work. So if you think about it from, the, from an educator's perspective, I've been uh, kind enough, <laughs> gracious enough to share my work into the commons by putting a CC license on it, but today it kind of goes into a black box and maybe somebody's using my work, but I don't really know. And so that doesn't feel very good. Um, it also, when I go for promotion and tenure and I tell my committee, you know, hey, I shared a bunch of OER with the world and they say, well, that sounds nice, but what's the data? What are the metrics? And I, today I say, well, I, I don't really know. Um, we want to yeah. We want to enable uh, easy dashboards where there's analytics on the use and reuse of one's work. So that'll be something that, that we'll be working on. Obviously, there are, are privacy concerns there because your work would be tracked and potentially uh, users' uses of your work would be tracked as well. So we'll, we're going to be obviously very careful about that. It'll be opt-in on both the author side and the user side. Um, so we'll have, you know, 
safeguards in place there. But at the same time, most people uh, that we've talked to early on seem okay with sharing their data and actually dedicating their data to the public domain. As Rachel said, data tend to be facts, which are not copyrightable anyway. Um, there are other things I could talk about, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. I want to um, get to maybe uh, maybe Rachel can take um, Kate's question. Is there a preferred index to OERs that either of you would recommend we use? Uh, 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 I'm sorry I that you only have three minutes to say. <laughs> Do your best. Like our OER guide. <laughs> what? Hello. I can paste in our VR guide that has a lot of um, sources on it. Um, hang on a sec. Here we go. I seem to be having some network problems. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I think they disconnected us or something. The PCC OER guide is such a great starting point, and I, I do tend to refer faculty there. The open textbook library is really good for full textbooks, and OER Commons is nice for having a bunch of different kinds of um, open formats, um, from whole courses to you know handouts and assignments, all the different kinds of things that we use, um, sort of more expanded than um, just an index of textbooks. Um, and since it's 2.59, I want to be respectful of people's time. So um, let me just see if we've missed any questions. We had kind of a side discussion on policy, and I apologize to the people on the phone that um, weren't able to see that in the chat. Um, but we had a really good question um, from Jane about um, PCC's letter um, that lets faculty add a Creative Commons license to work that they create on college time, and Rachel um, shared the link to the form that they use at PCC. Uh, it sounds like maybe the form was giving people they needed permissions. Um, I didn't think that they would. Um, I can paste in the text of the form. Although other people must have seen it because Oh, maybe it was just because it was on my screen. <laughs> Here's what is on the text of the, the form. I mean, it's just really simple, and it's not anything that's been like reviewed by a lawyer or anything like that. <laughs> um, but basically says, you know, fill fill this out, and we'll keep track of it. Thank you very much to both of our presenters today. And um, Elizabeth, I think we're about ready to stop our recording. Um, and uh, this recording will be available. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the timeline is on that. Elizabeth, if you could uh, weigh in, that would be helpful.